Hi, I'm Dr. Drew Bogner, President of Malloy College, and I'd like to welcome you to the Public Square 2.0. For several years, we had a regular show on telecare called the Public Square. Throughout history, the Public Square has been an important meeting place for townspeople to debate the key issues of the day. In our first Public Square TV show, we met with a variety of Long Islanders to discuss things like taxes, housing, discrimination, and a wide variety of other issues so important to the future of Long Island. With the Public Square 2.0, we're going in a slightly different direction. In this new program, we will be bringing you some of the great faculty that currently teach at Malloy College. They will share their insights on subjects that we hope will find both entertaining and enlightening. Our speaker today is author, educator, and music therapist Elizabeth Schwartz. Elizabeth practices music therapy at Alternatives for Children on Long Island and teaches music therapy at Malloy College. She presents frequently and is the author of several books. Today she is going to give us some insight into the science and art of how music provides health, healing, and harmony within our lives. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you. So the other day, I stopped after work to fill up my car with gas. It was late in the day, it was cold, it was rainy, it was wet. I pulled in and I could not remember which side of the car my gas tank was on. Finally found it, I pulled in, I got out of the car, I could not figure out where to put my credit card and which thing to press. It was cold, it was dark, it was raining, I was annoyed. And all of a sudden, that tiny little screen on those brand new gas pumps started to play that song you know, that song that was so popular that told you to be happy all the time, to forget all these annoyances, and to be happy all the time. And even I, as someone who knows a lot about music, stood a little taller, slumped a little less, and looked across at the guy at the other gas pump, and this guy who had been doing exactly what I had been doing a few seconds before, had stood up, and he looked at me and he smiled, and we both said, we might as well be happy. It was that piece of music that allowed the two of us to connect and allowed me to reconnect to something that was there, but I had forgotten about it, that happiness. But guess what? This was done deliberately. The music industry and the business industry understand very, very clearly the power of music to change our behavior. The music industry in the United States in 2013 was a $4.89 billion industry worldwide, $15 billion, because business and marketing knows that music has the power to change our behavior, and perhaps even to change us. You walk into the store, and you stay in the store a little bit longer, and you buy that extra pair of shoes, because the music that's pumping is something that you appreciate and that you enjoy. It gets your heart racing, and you're willing to stay a little bit longer to look for just that blue to go with your new skirt. Or you walk into a bar at night, and it says to you, let's stay and party. It's the music that holds you there. Business knows that. Marketing knows that. And we know about the power of music to create the opportunity for change in us and in our society. Now, we've always known about the power of music in, in the world. Human beings have created music their entire um, set of time, but it's only within the last 15 or 20 years that we're really beginning to look carefully at the neuroscience of music, as well as the biology of music, to understand exactly what's going on that allows for music to be so powerful in human beings. One of the books that um, was so influential in the past few years was written by a music neuroscientist named Daniel Levitin. It was a number one New York Times bestseller and it really provided all this information about how music changes people. One of the fascinating studies he did was he walked around in a very large city 
And he put a microphone in front of people and he said, here, sing this song, something familiar that everybody would know. And he put the microphone in there and he recorded them singing this song and then took them back to the laboratory and listened to thousands and thousands of recordings of the same song from all these non-musicians. And what they discovered that stati statistically the majority of people were able to sing that song in the same key or close to the same key as the recording that they might not have heard for 15 or 20 years. That's the power that music has in our brain. We know from music researchers now that infants as young as six months are able to hear and process and respond to pitch changes way before they understand or can use language. That's the power of music from a biologic standpoint, from an emotional social standpoint, and from the ability to change people. Let me show you what I mean. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Gonna take my light around the world. I'm gonna let it shine. Take my light around the world. I'm gonna let it shine. Take my light around the world. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Within that little experience, within that very short period of time, every person in this room was able to understand what I did as a fundamentally different human communication than talk or language. We were all able to process it and to respond in some way that had meaning to us. In that short little example, what we also did what I also did was take you through a number of emotional states simply by changing the elements of the music, changing the dynamic, the tempo, changing the timbre of my voice to allow you the opportunity to experience different emotional feelings, changes, and also some changes in your behavior, your movement patterns, your ability to be together within a society. So we know that music has the power to change people. What we do as music therapists is use that power not to get you to buy a new pair of shoes, but to allow the opportunity for people to be able to change in the way that they want to change. So when we're talking about music in therapy and music as therapy, we're talking about understanding music in a way that allows us to use it systematically to help our clients make the changes that they want to change through the music, but also through the relationship that's within the music. So why music for therapy? because it addresses complex issues, because it provides for lots of different opportunities for change, because it's accessible by all. I'm going to give you some examples. Music for healing. We know from research that music is able to reduce anxiety, to reduce stress, it reduces the perception of pain, that participation within the music allows for greater participation within your course of care for a client, and also demonstrated decreased lengths of stay within the medical facility. This translates into real dollars and cents. I'll give you an example that was in the news quite recently. Uh, Representative Gabby Giffords out in Arizona shot in the head with traumatic brain injury. Her family credited music therapy 
as one of the courses of therapy that allowed her to regain. Now, Gabby Giffords was in the news, but it could just as easily have been your neighbor who came back from Afghanistan with traumatic brain injury from a roadside bomb. In this country right now, the Center for Disease Control is um, saying that about one in every 68 children will be diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And music therapy can also be significant in helping people to gain health, physical health as well as mental health. I have families that I work with who have one, two, sometimes three children with autism. The child walked in today, mom's got three, a little baby, another one, and the one that was coming to school. Every time he walks into school, he can't process being there. He falls on the floor. Mom's there trying to grab baby. I looked at mom's face, and her face was so distressed. Help me. Help me. Child laying on the floor. So what do I do as a music therapist? Gonna take my light around the world. Because we know that music is able to be conserved and understood in the brain, it gives the opportunity for children on the autism spectrum to have increased attention, to have significantly less behaviors, decreased self-stimulation, as well as improved verbalization skills and social skills. We use the power of music to help these children, to help these families. And finally, to find harmony within our lives, whether it's someone with mental illness or someone at the end of life, whether it's a caregiver or someone who is looking for wellness, music can be an important part of that in order to give people the opportunity to gain harmony within their relationships, but within themselves. We know that music allows for memory recall. We also allow for people to connect together all through music. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Thank you. Welcome back to the Public Square 2.0. I'm Drew Bogner, president of Malay College. I'm here with Elizabeth Swartz, uh, who just gave a phenomenal presentation on music therapy and the power of music, and uh, did a little singing as part of that too, which, which you know, I was singing along too. I thought that was a good demonstration of the power of music. And I thought maybe we'd, we'd continue the conversation a little bit about music therapy, because sure. you just really went over that somewhat quickly, uh, the different um, possibilities um, and usages of music therapy in clinical settings mm -hmm. and so many different applications. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, music therapy as a profession then, because we you didn't really talk about that so much. Right. So we have a music therapy program at the college. Mm -hmm. We have an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree. So let's talk a little bit exactly about how you become a music therapist and what you know and, and where music therapists work, for instance. Great, great. Um, it's, it's surprising to people to understand the depth of training that music therapists have to have. And we are required not only to be excellent musicians, we have to be excellent musicians across four different parameters, which is um, piano, guitar, voice, and percussion. So in addition to your own personal instrument, you need to know that, and all about music theory, music neuroscience, music psychology. Um, and then you need to have the overlay of understanding people. So human development, psychology, abnormal psychology. And on top of that, you have to have the clinical skills of working one-on-one, -on -one relationship building group dynamics. So all of that is included with music yeah, therapy right. training. Um, we do train music therapists on three levels, bachelor, masters, and we do have a number of PhD programs. Um, across the country. Music therapists also take continuing education, uh, so we continue to learn across the span of, of our lives. 
um, in order to be a music therapist, you need to graduate from an approved college or university and then take a certifying exam, an, a national certifying exam. How many exam. clinical hours do you take? We take well over a thousand clinical yeah, hours, which yeah. is more than almost anybody except social work. Yes, right, um, yeah. And the reason we have to do that is because understanding how to connect with a person through music takes the actual doing of yeah. it. You can't learn that in a classroom. And at the college, we have a music therapy clinic, the Rebecca Center, Absolutely. which is one place where our students can gain some of that experience. So the typical clientele that, um, that a music therapist would work with would be really who? Right. I, I would say there isn't a typical clientele, and I have um, music therapist colleagues who work with neonatal intensive care unit, and I have one f friends who work at hospice, mm -hmm. so it runs the gamut. We are able to tailor our practice to meet the individual needs, so we're working in hospitals, we're working in rehabilitation centers, we're working a lot in schools, we're working in hospice facilities. We're also working in wellness. So there are music therapists who focus in on wellness. Mm -hmm. And then we also have music therapists who work in forensic settings, in, in jails, in youth uh, incarceration centers who are working with at-risk youth. I work with families, so I work a lot with family mm -hmm. dynamics mm -hmm. and very young children. So there is not a real typical. Wherever there is a need. So is that expanding? Is there expanding need for music therapists? We right now here in this area can't fill the jobs that are open. And that's a so very exciting that thing. Okay. <laughs> um, right at this point. Right. That we at this point have jobs that, um, that are continually coming up because people are beginning to understand the value of it and frankly the efficacy of it. Mm -hmm. um, we are very cost effective because we know how to work with groups and we also get results very quickly. And so um, there are facilities that are opening up almost all the time. And, the, and I think since I've been at Malloy, the, um, the, there's been a change in how the profession is viewed and what a music therapist can do in terms of its, uh, the ability to be able to get reimbursed and so forth. So I'm right on that? Yes, absolutely. That we are, we are working at getting reimbursed, but we do have music therapists who are re reimbursed by school settings, um, by a child's individual education plan, um, by insurance, by Medicare. And so we really have many, many revenue streams that allow for parents or caregivers to access music therapy. And I, I've seen that change where it's become seen as a more um, definable and important mm -hmm. therapeutic response to all these different situations that you talked about. Um, so much more acceptable and, and I don't want to say common necessarily, but much more than it was probably, right? Yeah, I used to, um, I used to have to explain all the time who I was and what I was. And now when I say I'm a music therapist, they go, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and that's a wonderful place to be right now. And I find, you know, when you were talking about the different modalities of, of uh, the different instruments, including mm -hmm. the voice that you have to be, you know, an expert in. I know when we were sitting here in the in the theater and the public square, which is also where the where the home of music department is, and we have all these practice rooms in in this building and so forth. And so. I never knew how many wonderful musicians we had on our campus, all the people playing their guitars and so forth, and many of them are music therapy yes, students. Yes, yes. And, it, and it's, it's, you, you know, you, it, you need have to be a bit of a musician to be able to be effective. Though. Yeah, you have to be quite a musician to absolutely, be effective. And absolutely. you also not only have to be able to play it, but you have to understand on a very intimate level um, what music is, is composed of and how you can use that in order to do the best work you can with yeah. your clients. Yeah, because it's it's music as a way of communicating right mm -hmm. as much as, yeah. as you're saying and you know. communicating through the music mu communicating through language yes. but also communicating in a way that is way beyond anything that is concrete yeah well I think that's what you were talking about in your presentation because music has a, a different ability to communicate than mm -hmm. language does yeah and even its ability to communicate emotion uh, cross-culturally. It seems to me that that is a, one of the real power of music, yeah. right? Right. That we can, wherever you go, you can recognize. When I began singing, no matter where I would have been, people would recognize that as a musical experience. And one of the reasons why music therapy works so well with children 
um, with autism or people on the autism spectrum is that they're able to kind of circumvent the deficits in communication that yeah, many yeah. of them have. And to communicate emotion. You know, there are common emotions mm -hmm. we have regardless of the culture in which we come from. You know, yeah. laughter. We understand humor. Mm -hmm. We might understand the context that made it funny, but it right. might, might vary a little bit culturally. But yet we know when someone is laughing that they're they're laughing because it's something happened that was funny or you're happy. Right, right. And music communicates that emotion so much better than language does. Because Absolutely. for me to try and describe that to you, right. very that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But it also creates those social bonds yeah. with people who might not have anything else in common so that we can be together as a society and people who perhaps have difficulty in other areas of social communication can be an important part of society yeah. and have that mutual activity that will be meaningful for everyone. And, and I know you, were, you mentioned too about the increasing prevalence of autism. Yes. And um, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit because people might be interested in that. You know, why is there more prevalence of that and why is music therapy an effective therapeutic response to that? Sure. Um, there, there really is not solid research on where the increase is coming from, but we do know that the increase is real. And it is significant in terms of our society and significant in, in terms of the human toll that it takes on parents and caregivers as well as society. And what we do know is the way that music is, is organized and the way music is put together is um, very much in line with the way people with autism think and organize their brain. And so music is a natural um, fit for people with autism because of the organizational factor of it, because of the ability to communicate emotion without language, and also the uh, ability to have reciprocity um, between two human beings that comes with making music together mm -hmm. that is um, critical for further growth of people with autism into the mainstream, but something that we do so easily and so effectively within the music setting. So if you're on, and I know we talk about it being on the autistic spectrum now, mm -hmm. um, knowing that there's a wide variety of um, manifestations yes. of that. Um, it is a um, condition of what? It is a neurobiological condition and that we... It manifests, it, what are it, the common characteristics? It, it manifests itself in, in really three different ways right now. Significant impairment in communication, significant impairment in social interaction, and also a difficulty with functional or non-functional behaviors. Uh, some people would describe that as, as self-stimulatory behaviors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So those three characteristics have to be present in order for a person to have a diagnosis on the autism spectrum. Um, it manifests itself, uh, traditionally we understand it as manifesting itself around 18 months. Mm -hmm. The brand new research that is being done in some areas of the country show that you can detect it um, actually through uh, eye movements and interaction with the caregiver as early as three to six months. We're just not qualified yet. We're not at the point where we can diagnose that So early. if you really, if you were you know, a viewer and you were concerned about that maybe with the case, where would you go to perhaps um, have a right. diagnosis? There's a number of places to go. Um, certainly within any of your county, you can call your Department of Health and express a concern, mm -hmm. and that will immediately trigger an opportunity to have your child evaluated. Um, I believe that Malloy is one place that you can bring your child to be evaluated. You can also go to your pediatrician is another place mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to do it. There are many, many websites that you can go to, but there is one that is uh, through the Center for Disease Control called Early Signs. And that is a, a very interactive website, very easy for parents to look at some of the qualifiers that might be in might be indications that they should have their child evaluated. So if you're interested in music therapy, where would you go? Where would you go? Of course, I would go to our college right here at Malloy <laughs> College. Um, that was the softball of all that questions. That was the softball <laughs> of all questions. Because um, if you didn't answer it that way, I would have had to probably understand. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do have a, a very excellent program here, but there's a number of excellent programs. Yeah. But our professional organization is based right outside of Washington, D.C. It's called the American Music Therapy Association. We have a wonderful website called musictherapy.org where parents and caregivers, teachers can um, 
look at information and get different fact sheets on research on music therapy uh, outcomes as well as information on how to access music therapy as well as how to access a music therapist. Which is great because that was the next question I was going to ask you where you can go to get more information about all those kinds of things. So that's very helpful. So will you have a, maybe a last thought about the power of music you'd just like to share to, for our viewers? I, I would love to do that. Um, as a music therapist, I see what it can do for people who have certain needs. But I really think that we as a society need to get back to where we used to be, where music was a part of self, part of society, and not something that is owned by the outside establishment of that multi-billion dollar uh, industry. Yeah. And so the more we sing together, the more we make music together, the healthier I believe we will be as a society. Yeah, and I think that's a wonderful thought. So thank you, Elizabeth, for being with thank us. Thank you so much for I appreciate it for sharing me. your ideas. Thank you as well as our audience for being here for the Public Square 2.0. And we hope you'll be able to join us on more of our shows. So thank you very much.